Thanks. So I might have, uh, as often happens with these sorts of things, bit off more than I can not necessarily chew, but at least digest. And there's a few things that I had promised to do in the abstract that I won't be doing, uh, but maybe we can do in the Q&A, like working through examples. And uh, the paper isn't completely finished, so there'll be parts where I'm just summarizing. As often happens, it's also ballooned longer than could easily be uh, completely read. So um, the beginning point is thinking about our, our human nature. And as human beings, you know, we inquire about this as well as de developing and deforming our nature and living it out and arguing about it. So the, the paper itself is, um, I won't even say it's eg necessarily exegetical. It's more just putting together a bunch of passages and then providing some connections and commentaries. And then we'll have a little bit of comparison to Plato and the Stoic philosopher Epictetus on this. Um, so early in book one of Aristotle's Politics, there's a short passage of central importance for understanding the complex nature of human beings. Aristotle has just earlier sketched for us the development of human communities, ranging from the household through the village to the city-state, noted different teleologies for these, and asserted the human being is, that the human being is the political or social animal by nature. And then he tells us why human being is a political animal more than any bee or other gregarious animal is clear. For as we say, na nature does nothing in vain, and human being alone of the animals possesses logos. So in the context of this passage, we typically translate this as speech or language. Um, but I just leave it in the original Greek to preclude narrowing the sense of the term. We do want to keep in mind its fuller range of meaning, encompassing not just possession and use of communication, but also our capacity and in instances of reasoning. And then he draws a distinction between different modalities of communication. Other animals possess voice, phone, and this allows them to indicate a reference, more literally to use or make a sign to each other of the pleasurable and the, and the painful. As he notes, their nature has progressed to the extent that they have sensation, isthesen, of the painful and the pleasurable, and to be able to signal these by signs to each other. And we might, of course, view these capacities to feel pain and pleasure and communicate these with others of their kind as present to greater or lesser degree among the many things falling in the animal kingdom. Um, Coming back to human beings, we can ask what wider scope possessing logos, in addition to phone, yields to human beings. Aristotle tells us logos is oriented towards indicating the useful and the harmful, the likewise the right and the wrong, todikaion uh, kai adikon, for this is what is distinctive, idion, of human beings by comparison to the other animals, alone having perception, isthesin, of the good and the bad, and the just and the unjust, and the other moral qualities, kaitai alon. And it is sharing, koinonia, in these that produces the household and the city state, the passage referenced earlier. So there's a lot to unpack in this and more to connect up with other important discussions within Aristotle's corpus. So at this point, let us confine ourselves to three main points. First, we should note that analogously to phone, <coughs> logos allows the human being to both register or literally apprehend or perceive and to communicate about a range of mat matters. Second, those explicitly referred to in this passage include the pleasurable and the painful, the useful and the harmful, the right and the wrong, the good and the bad. And then Aristotle extends this to all the others. Rackham's translation adds the term moral qualities, not there in the original Greek, but that strikes me as a needed on point and helpful gloss. And then Aristotle asserts that we human beings share in or have partnership in these, and this is what makes or produces human communities. Where else in Aristotle's work do we find him deliberately distinguishing ranges of moral qualities from each other in similar matters? Well, in Nicomachean Ethics, Book 2, Discussion of Pain and Pleasure's Relevance to Moral Virtue and Vice, he tells us there are three matters that are the motives of choices, estas hereses, and three matters that are the motives of avoidances. These are the noble, the useful, and the pleasurable, and their opposites, the base, the harmful, and the painful. So not exactly the same list. He goes on to tell us that with respect to all of these, the good person, who agathos, is likely to get these matters right, and the bad person, kakos, is likely to get these matters wrong. 
So notice that he again references four distinct sets of opposed moral values, three of which are matters and motives for basic functions of practical reasoning, decision, and action, and one of which is applied directly to persons. Book five of Nicomachean Ethics is devoted entirely to clarifying notions of and distinguishing modalities of justice and injustice, another of these paired opposite moral values. In that book, Aristotle will bring in some other opposed pairs of moral qualities, most notably the good and the bad, and the useful and the harmful. And since justice in the sense of complete virtue encompasses the virtues in relation to others, one could make a case that at least that modality of justice involves the noble and the base. Other opposed concepts play central roles as well, the equal and the unequal, the lawful and the unlawful, and the voluntary and involuntary. Book six of the Nicomachean Ethics centered from the beginning on an, another important set of values, the true or the true and falsity or the false. And Aristotle notes that in the theoretical or speculative domain in which we're unconcerned with action or production, doing well or badly is just a matter of attaining truth or falsity. Very interesting feature of Aristotle's account, however, is that he extends truth into practical and productive domains. So in Book 6, he, this is framed in terms of practical truth, aletheia practicae, which introduces several additional components. He tells us that in the sphere of desire or affectivity and urexe, pursuit and avoidance correspond to affirmation and denial in the sphere of the intellect. He also clarifies the distinctive human goodness we call virtue requires that the choice, the proiresis, be structured or guided in three ways. The principle or reason, the logon, must be true. The desire or affectivity must be right or straight. And desire or affectivity must pursue the same things to outa that principle or reason affirms. Notice that these same things could be read as the same particular concrete matters, or they could be more abstract moral values or anything in between. There are two other things to highlight in this section of Book 6. The first one is rather general. He tells us there are three things in the soul most determinative with respect to action and truth. Perception, aesthesis, intellect, nous, and desire, affectivity, orexis. He then says that, Perception is not an origin or principle of action evidenced by the fact that animals possess it but don't share in action, praxis. They don't participate in it like we do. And the second one adds more to the picture of truth or action. Aristotle writes, the cause of action is choice, and the cause of choice is desire or affectivity and reasoning directed to some end. Logos ho henica tinos. So choice is not without intellect or thought, nor is it without moral habit. In his analysis of friendship in Book 8, Aristotle distinguishes between, as we all know, three main types and motives for friendship. He suggests we should begin by distinguishing what can be loved or liked. And this falls into three main categories, namely what is good, agathon, what is pleasant, and what is useful. They're chresimon. We should note as well, Aristotle points out, that friendship and justice are concerned with the same sorts of matters, and he uses the term koinonia within that discussion. Another important text, a uh, third one for us to turn to, is the art of rhetoric. Discussing the scope, usage, and moral status of rhetoric, Aristotle makes several key points. One of these is quite general, against the common criticism that a person who makes unjust use of such a faculty of speech may do a great amount of harm. He points out that eh, the same objection can apply just as well to all the other goods, with the exception of virtue, and especially to those things that are most useful, such as strength or health or wealth or strategy. When these, these just, just as these, when justly used, may be of the greatest benefit. When they are unjustly used, they can cause harm. Then he also notes that rhetoric is similar to dialectic in terms of its range. It's not confined to one single domain of subjects, but like dialectic is of general application. And we might want to remind ourselves of a related point Aristotle makes in the topics, book one, where he distinguishes between ethical, physical, and logical matters, and he notes that they have different kinds of propositions and problems. We could say different uses of logos and distinct opposed qualities are involved in them. There's two additional discussions from book one of the rhetoric I think are useful. One of these is the tripartite distinction Aristotle makes about the means of persuasion. There are three kinds of means of persuasion furnished through discourse, 
dia tu logu. Some of them are in the moral character of the speaker. Some are in the hearer being placed in a certain state of mind. Others are in the discourse itself through its displaying something or appealing to display something. And these are the well-known and often invoked three main modes, ethos, logos, and pathos. And we should note that Aristotle criticizes earlier writers for only paying attention to pathos, but not logos and, and ethos. Um, and he, you know, he says that we need to be able to follow logical reasoning or more literally syllogizing, to syllogistai. Um, they also have to study characters and virtues. Uh, we need to understand the human emotions and how these, these things work. And the discussion culminates in an important connection made between rhetoric and not only dialectic, but also ethics and political science, demonstrating a kind of continuity between these. Another particularly important discussion for these moral qualities is Aristotle's distinction between the three main types of rhetoric. He differentiates these along several lines, the first of which is the kind of audience persuasive discourse is being aimed at, and so we get uh, uh, three kinds of rhetorical speeches, deliberative, forensic, and epideictic. Um, each of these lines up neatly with a time as well, a pair of actions and an end. Deliberative speech is oriented towards future actions. It involves exhorting and dissuading the listeners, persuading them towards doing or endorsing something or away from that. Its end, or rather the values it's centered by, are the useful and the harmful. Sum feron kai blabaron. Forensic speech is focused on the past that involves accusing and defending, and the values it focuses upon are the just and the unjust, the dikaion kai de adikon. Epideictic speech is primarily about the present, but as Aristotle notes, it can also involve the other two times. It involves praising and blaming or criticizing, and the values that it is about are the noble and the base, the kalon and eishron. Aristotle does concede these three sets of moral values are not exclusively associated with these three types of rhetoric. So deliberative rhetoric, while concerned with the useful and harmful, may bring in considerations of the just and the unjust or the noble and the base. But as he says, these are included as accessory in reference to this. Um, there is one other text that we want to bring up, or at least one book of it. And that is the already mentioned topics. And the reason for adding that work into this mix is that book three is not only focused on ethical argumentation, but explores a set of topics centrally important for moral life and these moral qualities, what we can broadly call comparison, preference, or prioritization between different general or specific things bearing moral qualities. To be sure, Aristotle explores this comparative dimension in detail as he sets out and suggests reasoning topics and subject matters uh, in Rhetoric Book 1. Uh, but Topics Book 3 frames these matters from the start in terms of what, what is more choice-worthy or preferable, uh, or the better of two or more things, baltion duen e pleionon. And he notes that the inquiry there doesn't focus on things that are widely different and easy to choose between. We don't need help with that. But on those that are closer together and about which we have to work a bit more to determine which would be better. Those things that are controversial. A bit later on in book three, he references these comparis as comparisons, um, prosalela sum crises, and notes that the commonplaces or topoi that he's provided are also useful for showing something as worthy of choice or avoidance. Per se, he provides a number of ways one can or should argue, and many of the examples he employs bear on what is good or just or noble or the opposites of that. Among these ways are what is more lasting, what a prudent person, a right law, or those skilled in a discipline would choose, what is worthy of, more worthy of choice for its own sake, what is good absolutely, what is an ends or a means closer to an end. We can go on and on and on. There's a whole bunch of these interesting considerations for practical reasoning. So after this brief excursus through passages drawn from these Aristotelian texts, let's take a moment to consider the ranges of moral values that have recurringly appeared in them. Uh, there's two things I'd like to do here. One is simply to note the associated terminology Aristotle uses for each of these ranges of values. The second is to point out the breadth of meaning and reference each of these moral quality terms encompass. So consider the useful and the harmful, the sumferon and blabaron. Aristotle uses these terms frequently, but they're not the only ones he employs. 
Uh, for the positive, he also uses chresimon and ophelion. Um, the opposite of the useful, the harmful, is invoked less often and doesn't appear to be replaced by synonyms, but instead gets particularized through terms that signify ways of being harmful or hindrances or counterproductive or leading to bad things. Aristotle is also pretty consistent in using the paired opposites of pain and pleasure or the painful and the pleasurable. He doesn't make much use of, of uh, synonymous terms except in terms of like enjoyment or stuff like that. I will point out as a side note that in later Hellenistic accounts of moral philosophy, we do see a shift from speaking of lupe and the luperon to using other terms like ponos and algedon. Um, Aristotle also tends to use dikon and adikon pretty consistently without shifting to other synonymous terms. And he uses kalon and aistron in a similarly consistent manner. Um, we see more terms ranged over when it comes to the good and the bad, the agathon and kakon. We have, of course, virtue and vice terms coming from them, arete, kakia, the latter of which is sometimes replaced by mokferia or poneria. Uh, spudaios is used quite a bit as a term denoting a good person, and there's a variety of other terms applied to bad people, for example, poneros, right? And moving on from noting various words Aristotle uses, well, what about the range and the richness uh, of meaning of these terms for these opposed moral qualities? None of these are remotely univocal terms. Consider what goes into being useful or advantageous. We have a wide vocabulary of synonyms for that in English, ranging from expedient to helpful, beneficial, salutary, we sometimes think of the useful as possessing whatever value it has, its distinct mode of goodness, solely because it leads to or is a means for or produces something that is actually good to things we genuinely value for their own sake. But, you know, within the domain of the useful, we often encounter things that are useful uh, because they conduce in some way to other things that are just useful themselves. And for some people in our broader culture, and I think we probably also see this in ancient Greek culture, things and people that are useful sometimes take on this aura of sort of self-evident goodness as well. In his books, Aristotle points out that pleasure and the pleasant and their opposites provides a pretty wide range. Human beings can enjoy, value, desire, pursue, and procure a vast variety of pleasures. Similarly, they can uh, dislike and avoid many different things as pains or painful. Some of these are mainly bodily, others mental or psychical. Um, Aristotle recognizes some of the things people think are pleasurable and painful are so just because of habituation or assumptions that they make. Um, the pleasant hope of retaliation and anger, for example. He also views some pleasures as better, some as worse, some genuinely pleasant, at least for the good developed persons, others as only apparently pleasant, which is kind of a funny thing to say. Um, to realize that the just and the unjust, another range, are complex, encompassing a number of distinct, sometimes overlapping, complementary or, or opposed meanings, we only have to look at Nicomachean Ethics Book 6 where he discusses, among others, legal justice, justice is complete virtue, distributive justice, rectificatory justice, reciprocity, and equity. In the politics, one point Aristotle makes multiple times is how people get what is just, partly right and partly wrong, typically by focusing on their own legitimate perspective and ignoring that of others in their community. He also tells us in Book 5 that both justice and injustice are equivocal terms. These are clearly, there are clearly multiple manners in which a person in action, a situation, or a relationship can be just or unjust. The difficulties we experience translating the terms kalon and aistron into English in non-misleading or non-unduly restrictive ways should suggest to us how wide the ranges of meaning these moral qualities have. Beauty and, uh, beautiful and ugly, honorable and shameful, noble and base, fair and foul are just some of the common translations. Um, and it's not just an English thing as well. As Terence Irwin points out in a, in a work on the Cologne and Aristotle, there's a similar complexity about how to tr render this term even in Latin, right? So both of these moral qualities uh, within this range uh, range across what in the present we often distinguish from each other as aesthetic and moral domains, but they seem to be you know, occupying a lot of the same space. When we get to the agathon and kakon, the phrase good is spoken of in many ways, come natu comes naturally to mind. 
Whether or not we accept Aristotle's listing of categories as an adequate account, it's worth noting that he explicitly invokes it and provides examples of the multiple ways in which something can be good, right? Presumably, we can apply this to almost as many ways, maybe substance would be an, an issue, of being bad. Um, so we've got this incredibly rich uh, range of, of moral qualities, right? And so I thank your indulgence in bearing with me as I work through these passages. We're likely all familiar with, highlighted several interconnected matters involved in Aristotle's moral theory and made this brief excursus into t terminology and meaning. We come back now to our starting point considering as human beings what the nature of human beings is. And, you know, concise definitions are certainly useful, but for answering this kind of question, I would say definitions aren't really what we ultimately want. Saying that we are animals who are rational remains just at the level of a formula. What we want is a fuller, systematic, complicated unpacking, for lack of a better word, of what's contained in that pregnant term, logos or logikon. In his works, as Aristotle admits, at least in the Nicomachean Ethics, he provides us with many general outlines which then we're expected to fill in. At times, we also need to bring outlines from one work and fit them into one from another. And what we do have or can construct reading across Aristotle's works is a complex, robust, sometimes puzzling, sometimes beset by lacunae, conception of human beings as rational, communicative, social animals. This includes the entire field of moral life, itself very complex in its many dimensions. It also includes an admittedly incomplete at points account about how human action works. And we might bring some of these discussions together, uh, taking off of that Nicomachean Ethics 5 passage cited earlier, to say that we human beings are motivated, choose, and act in terms of what we perceive, what, we're, uh, what we uh, are effectively uh, moved by or desiring. And I, I had a typo here as I was writing this. How we logos through our mind or intellect. And I kind of like that. You know, as I read through that, I was like, yeah, well, that's, that's what we do. We don't just legain, we, you know, or logidzain, we, we use logos. We're constantly involved with it. And I realize that may sound a little Heideggerian, but we, we don't necessarily have to go down that path. And so we can say, well, what is it we actually perceive? All sorts of things, including those we take in through the senses as object of sense. Perception plays an important role in moral life and in human action because it takes in particulars. We all know, you know that that's uh, a key part of his moral theory. But it also grasps moral uh, qualities of matters we encounter and are engaged in. And, of course, people can get these wrong, and that naturally brings us to considering other main characteristic activities we human beings do in relation to these moral qualities. We communicate about moral qualities in a vast variety of manners with each other, and some human beings spend a significant amount of their time involved in that sort of communication. Not just ethics teachers, but gossipers would be an example of that. This would involve trying to persuade each other about them, arising in some cases because we disagree about or are in conflict over them. As Aristotle notes in Rhetoric Book 3, Teaching involves persuasion. Trying to educate or inform others, rightly or wrongly, is another dimension of communication. Deliberating may be done silently on one's own or even elided over by responses rooting in developed habits and implicit reasoning processes. But often deliberation in its many contexts is carried out through communication and involves other people in its activity. We may also depict matters involving moral qualities through our artistic productions and our, and our, we uh, are communicated with and perceive these moral qualities when we engage with those projects. You know, when we watch a TV show, for example. All of these distinctively human activities take place within communities or sharings, often a number of overlapping and intersection koinonia. So going back to the politics passage, let's remind ourselves it's possessing Logos, perceiving and communicating about moral qualities, sharing in these that generates communities. We also find ourselves, every generation, already existing in complex moral matrices involving this sharing, communicating, perceiving, reasoning about and from and contesting moral qualities, not only as generalities, you know, what is the good, what is the beautiful, uh, but in myriad particular situations and everything in between.
So that's the Aristotle part. Um, comparing Aristotle with Plato, going backwards a little bit. Um, Aristotle, of course, is not the first ancient Greek thinker to distinguish and focus on these sets of opposed moral qualities. Um, they come up consistently in the Euthyphro, the Credo, and the Phaedo, where they're mentioned in conjunction with each other. The three recurringly referenced pairs of moral qualities are the just and the unjust, the good and the bad, the noble and the base. These are what it is that gods and human beings disagree about in ways that are difficult to resolve, thereby ending up in conflict, feeling and dri being driven by anger and hatred with each other. These also come up in the Credo, where Socrates suggests the Credo that they continue listening to or honoring good rather than bad opinions, which derive respectively from the wise and the foolish. Now, who is the wise? The expert, the person who understands moral qualities, namely the just and the unjust, the base and the noble, the good and the bad. This is the person who, in the truth, in these matters of just things and noble things and good things and uh, their opposites, who is in the truth. So it's important from uh, Socrates' perspective to live well, and that means living nobly and justly. We return to these three ranges of value in the Phaedo, where the discussion of philosophy's uh, connection with the forms. Socrates references justice itself and uh, nobility or beauty and goodness, kalon, getai, the saying we don't grasp these, here's an diff important difference, we don't grasp these through eisthesis, the senses of the body, they're an impediment, but through pure thinking, um, which allows us to view them as what they genuinely are. Um, looking at Simeus' argument, Socrates narrates his turn away from engaging with natural questions and Anaxagoras' unsatisfying account towards an approach more metaphysical and moral at the same time by making a new start, focusing on beauty itself, on goodness and greatness and all the others. Once, once again, we see kai ta'ala panta. The good and the bad, the beautiful or noble, the ugly and the base, the just and the unjust are referenced over and over again throughout Plato's dialogues. In the Gorgias, for example, the namesake Rhetor tells Socrates, rhetoric is the art of persuasion in the courts of law and other assemblies. And what does it persuade about? The just and the unjust. Um, Socrates, of course, gets him to admit the art and its user produce persuasion that is merely a belief of a matter of belief or opinion, not knowledge or instruction. And he also conjoles Gorgias into expounding what else rhetoric deals with, um, namely any of the matters germane to the lesser arts the rhetorician can speak about. And two sorts of examples uh, clearly deal with the range of value Aristotle identified with deliberative rhetoric, the useful and the harmful. That's building the walls of Athens and getting a reluctant patient to submit to their physician's treatment. And so presumably we can interpret Gorgias as thinking that rhetoric also deals with the beautiful or noble or the ugly or base. Um, and this isn't guesswork because Socrates will shortly criticize Gorgias's art and portrayal of its practitioners. And he asks whether the rhetorician, ignorant of the other arts whose matters he nevertheless speaks and per produces persuasion about, isn't also as ignorant of the just and the unjust, the base and the noble, and the good and the evil. When it comes to any subject, does the rhetor actually know anything about what is good and evil, base or noble, just or unjust in them? And the answer is negative. So this means that if the student of rhetoric is to understand these matters, they better bring that understanding from somewhere else. As we learn a little bit later in the dialogue, Socrates also thinks rhetoric is not only prone to being appropriated for injustice, but is itself an ignoble or base art because it's a kind of flattery, right? It's, it's, so it's, it's already within those ranges. Threaded throughout Plato's dialogues, we see a central motivating concern for determining and knowing teaching and learning, deciding and acting upon what the good and the bad, the just and the unjust, and the noble and the base are. Perhaps it is the case that justice itself or the form of justice isn't ultimately the same thing as the form of the good referenced in the Republic or beauty in the Symposium, which are arguably the same. But we can say that for Plato, there's certainly considerable overlap between instances of the just and the noble and the good, and presumably their opposites as well. Aristotle at, other, at times points out similar interconnections, but seems to maintain stronger distinctions or differentiations between these modalities than does Plato. And there's three other important differences to highlight here when it comes to moral values. 
The first is that Aristotle evinces much less suspiciousness than Plato often does about the positive values of pleasures and the pleasant. Pleasure, pleasant things, pleasure, and the pleasurable are genuinely good for Aristotle. The pleasant, pleasure is not the good as such, and there are higher, better, more satisfying goods than just what is pleasant. Um, but, you know, it is, it is a good. Um, another important difference concerns the useful and the harmful. Again, Aristotle frames the useful as a genuinely positive modality or a range of value, though its goodness is tied to its being useful or something that ultimately possesses a different kind of value. And he, as he points out, many things that possess or bear these higher things are useful. Uh, the higher values are also useful. The virtuous friend uh, will tend to be useful. Um, and it would be reductive to hazard that in Plato's works, he always interprets whatever is genuinely useful as so because it's either good or noble or just. And similarly, whatever is harmful is so precisely because it's evil, base, or unjust. But that does seem to be, on the whole, how he typically treats the useful and the harmful. And then a third important difference stems from an opposed pair of values we see Plato occasionally discussing and Aristotle seemingly unconcerned with in at least the ethical political works. In the Euthyphro, the discussion aims to determine the nature of the holy or the pious and the unholy or impious. And the terms there uh, used are to hosion, uh, to anosion, and then Eusebes and to Asebes. And Socrates tries to deer, steer their discussion towards what in the many instances of the holy and unholy is the forms of both. Auto de auto homoion kai echon mian tina idean, he says. Another interesting dialogue in this respect would be the Protagoras, right, in which we find added to the usual four uh, cardinal platonic virtues, the fifth, which is piety or holiness. Um, so those are some important differences, I think. And then if we want to bring a Stoic thinker into the, consider, in, into the conversation, uh, we can make some interesting points of comparison between that school and that of Aristotle. Like Aristotle, uh, the Stoics think there is an intrinsic connection between human nature as rational. Um, where is that? Uh, I just lost my... <laughs> Here we go. Uh, rational and as social and political. One can legitimately draw a difference between Aristotle's focus on the polis as the central locus for a community and uh, his stark contrast between Greeks and barbarians, which would condemn nearly all of us, I imagine, and the Stoic emphasis on cosmopolitanism, the universal community of human beings and the gods mentioned by Seneca, Marcus Aurelius, and Epictetus. But if we read attentively in Stoic literature, we see them just as concerned with how we live, act, and relate as social beings within the smaller communities of the family, the city, the nation, and a number of other groups, organizations, and institutions. Like, how do you behave yourself at the theater? You know, um, The Stoics, like Platonists and Aristotelians, are virtue ethicists who develop rich and robust accounts of practical reasoning, desire and affectivity, deliberation and decision, choice and commitment, moral evaluation and development, and human action. The language they employ sometimes differs in significance or functions according to particular terms. Great example of this would be thumos, Stoics use it to mean one specific kind of anger. Uh, Aristotle and his school use it as, alternately as a synonym for orge and to denote one of three modes of affectivity. Plato and his many interpreters take it to be one of three parts of the human soul, which happens to get angry, right? The Stoics routinely reference and employ those five main paired moral qualities that we see these other schools and thinkers using. The good and the bad, the just and the unjust, the noble and the base, the pleasurable and the painful, the useful and the harmful. Um, contrary to Cicero's suggestion that when it comes to these matters, differences between Platonists, Aristotelian, and the Stoics are merely linguistic, there is a very important difference between them. This comes from the Stoic doctrine of the indifference, which is admittedly complex and in parts paradoxical, but which can be briefly summarized here. There are some things that are genuinely good and some things that are genuinely bad. And then in addition to them, there are things that are neither genuinely good or bad, but indifferent, not making a difference to the happiness or misery, the goodness or badness of a human being. The vast realm of the indifference is further divided into those involving or providing positive value called preferred and those bearing negative value called rejected. 
of the five main pairs of moral qualities we've been looking at, the Stoics place three of these within the domain of genuine goodness or badness. The good and the bad, obviously, along with the noble and the base, and the just and the unjust. In the works of Stoics and interpretations of their doctrines, these three sets of moral qualities are closely connected with each other, the pleasurable and the painful, the useful and the harmful. Stoics explicitly frame as ranges of preferred and rejected indifference, by contrast. These don't lack all value, but the value they have lies below the threshold of genuine goodness and badness. How we human beings use, regard, prioritize, interpret indifference is important for Stoics. The, value, the virtues and vices often bear upon these, and Stoics strive to get themselves and others to rightly identify, prioritize, choose, and pursue the genuinely good as opposed to guiding their lives and decisions by considerations of the pleasant and the painful or the useful and the harmful. The late Stoic Epictetus explicitly introduces another set of interesting considerations about the beginning and function of philosophy, an activity he, like many others, views as the art of life, a development of the human person, ideally everyone would engage in, but which tends to be ignored by most people. And these turn on a concept that seems to originate with the Epicureans but gets appropriated by the Stoics, that of prolapsis, often translated as preconception or general conception. So let's note just three things Epictetus says here. The first is all of us human beings possess and use these preconceptions, but most of us tend to get them wrong a good bit of the time. And this happens when we apply them to particulars, which could mean screwing up in concrete cases, but also could involve getting them generally and commonly wrong. The second thing is that the set of preconceptions we have um, as preconceptions don't conflict with each other or contradict each other, umachatai, but they can be in contradiction when we apply them to particulars or specifics. And he goes so far as to say most of our human problems uh, lie in the, in the failure to properly apply these. And then the third is philosophy itself has a very different origin for Epictetus than it does for Plato or Aristotle. It has its origin in noting the, difference, the disagreements between human beings. And the work of philosophy involves clarifying these preconceptions. So among these preconceptions are a number of opposed pairs. For example, what is up to us and what is not up to us, famously labeled in the present, the dichotomy of control, an idea, by the way, that's already there in Aristotle and Nicomachean Ethics Book, book 3. Um, what other things count as preconceptions? So consider this brief passage. Who does not admit that the good, to agathon, is beneficial, some ferron, and choice-worthy, hyroton, and that we should seek and pursue it in every circumstance? And who among us doesn't assume that what is just, to dikaion, is honorable, kalon, and appropriate, prepon? Uh, so we already see all these moral qualities being, being talked about there and related to each other. There's other relevant examples of preconceptions within Epictetus' work. In addition to these invocations of four of the five sets of moral values or qualities we have devoted so much discussion to, the pleasant and the painful is clearly among them. The endurable and unendurable, the choice worthy and its opposite, the appropriate and the inappropriate, what is in accordance with duty, what's contrary to it. These are just a few important for moral life. So let's close by noting another set of preconceptions argued about or examined in, in uh, uh, Book 1, Chapter 2, the reasonable, eulogon, and unreasonable, alogon. Epictetus explicitly addresses himself to the logikon zone and notes the importance of education, or paideia, which allows us to learn how to apply the, these preconceptions of the reasonable and the unreasonable, as well as the others, in harmony with nature. He adds that judging what is reasonable and unreasonable requires making use of valuations not only of external things, but also of what is connected to each person's proper character or role, the prosopon that uh, he, he talks about quite a bit. And so we can see by comparison that in each of these, uh, let's call them traditions, these moral qualities are, are incredibly important, and a lot of our moral life consists in trying to figure our way out you know, through mistaken conceptions of these. We're constantly getting these, these wrong. But uh, Aristotle seems to take this, just to bring this to a close, 
as being, you know, what it means to be a, a rational being, to uh, be in communities where we share in these, we argue about these, we contest these, we learn about these, we deliber deliberate about them. And I, I would say that I think this is a really important insight on his part. And so I'll just close there. Yeah, and this needs a lot of work. So I'm looking forward to critical feedback. Yeah. This is more like a comment, but so I like a lot the way you you draw that connection between logos and the different moral qualities. And I think it looks like the logos is unifying all of them. So if I say, would you say that the moral qualities are expressions of logos or actualization of logos in different um, aspects? Or is there a unity of virtues in, in, in terms of a logos as a thread? Or I know, I'm struggling to find the right. I, don't, I, don't, I mean, I, having logos makes it possible for us to go beyond the other animals in However we want to translate eistasis, you know, registering, perceiving, grasping, uh, and then communicating about these. But I, I don't think that they're all like, I mean, they're all part of logos in the sense that like we can reference them through logos. We can think about them. Um, but they're, for, you get the idea that for Aristotle, they're, they're, they're irreducible to each other, you know? Um, he, and, says the sentence, he says so explicitly, right? Yeah. I mean, and, and he, he never says, like, all of them together in one place, in one text, as far as I know. But um, he's always distinguishing them, right? But then he'll, he'll also, like, correlate them. Like, you know, yeah, of course the just is useful in a, in a certain sense, you know. Or, uh, so animals do not have logos and do not have moral qualities. So they perceive some of the moral qualities, right, the pleasant and the painful. But now here's an interesting question that we don't go into. Do they register the pleasant and the painful, or do they signal it to each other in the ways that we do? We certainly overlap to, to a certain extent. Like, you know, think about your pets and how they like to cuddle with you, and they see cuddling as a good thing because it's pleasant and perhaps comforting. But I don't know that my cat or dog, let alone lower animals, like somebody's like, hey, I'm going to cuddle my snake or my spider. They're not getting remotely out of it what, what we are. And I'm, I'm actually, you know, this is a bit of a digression. I'm willing to say that ancient philosophers were too rigid in um, how they understood the break between human beings and whatever else is rational, like gods or stuff like that, and then the other animals. You know, I'm willing to say that um, when we talk about these higher animals like cetaceans and elephants and perhaps, you know, corvids, that maybe they participate in a lot more than, than ancient thinkers did in this, this range of, you know, uh, problem solving and, and appreciating things in perhaps a moral perspective, but they, they don't do it to, to the extent that we human beings do. I mean, we're constantly jabbering about this kind of stuff, right? Most, most of the time wrongly, you know? I mean, that's what social media basically is most of the time, is people making value judgments about one thing or another and then expressing it, you know? Yeah. I was intrigued by a point you made very briefly that I'd like to hear more about. Uh, and that was that Plato stigmatizes the pious and impious. Yeah. And to a certain extent, contrasting him with Aristotle in, in that respect. At least with the ethical works, right? I mean... Oh, that's I, I, I kind of want to question that. Okay. Um, both Plato, Plato in the Euthyphro and Aristotle in um, Miss Mackey Ethic Book 5 discuss the pious as a part or a species of justice. Right, right. Um, and I'm just wondering, uh, is it really as, obviously not as, we can really say it was as, but as relatively unimportant in our problem compared to Plato as, as you suggested? Because it really does seem to have a very important place in human life, in the life of the homeless, in, uh, in human community, that the relation of humans to the gods. Yeah, yeah. Uh, 
really does seem, I, I would say, have a very significant place in our folks. I'm just wondering, I, I, I'm just well, wondering a bit how great the difference between Plato and Aristotle is. So, so here's what I would say about that. Um, you know, in the Euthyphro, uh, piety isn't just a form of justice. That winds up leading to another aporia, right? So I don't know that I that's... Don't want to say that's because Euthyphro doesn't, doesn't get it. Uh, yeah, I mean, that, that could be it, yeah. So I, 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 I do want to hold out that it's not um, something reducible to the other modalities. That, I mean, it intersects with them, but isn't exactly the same. I don't see it as playing that much of a role. I mean, Aristotle doesn't talk. I mean, if so, in Nicomachean Ethics, there are a few places where um, there are mentions of the gods, but not an awful lot. You know, and, and when he's talking about like the construction of the polis and in the politics, he does say, well, you got all these different officials and like some have to watch jails and some have to be responsible for temples, but he doesn't seem to care an awful lot about the religious life or like about prayer or stuff like that as, as you'd, you'd think. Is that lost treatise on prayer? So we well, yeah, there you go, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, and that's not to say that uh, you couldn't be an Aristotelian and care about those things a lot, right? But I, I just, I, maybe I'm, I, I just don't see it, but maybe I haven't read Aristotle as deeply as I need to. Yeah, I'm looking yeah. at Lambda 8, and he says, um, our forefathers in the most remote ages have handed down to us their posterity a tradition in the form of a myth that these substances are gods, Mm. The rest of the tradition has been added later in mythical form with a view to the persuasion of the multitude and to its legal and utilitarian expediency. They say these gods are in the form of men and like some other animals, and they say other things consequent on and similar to these which we've mentioned. Yeah, so if yeah. We were to separate the first point, right? So, like, that to me, he doesn't, he doesn't believe in the gods as, like, well, yeah, yeah. He believes in the gods that are worshipped uh, in the city. Yeah. Well, well, so there, well, at least there's the answer. Yeah, at least with Plato, though, there's the, and the Stoics also have this yeah. too that we can be the friends of the gods in, we can be part of this commonwealth with them. Now that doesn't seem to involve an awful lot of like obeisance and sacrifices and even prayer that much, right? He just says it does. He says he says that he says the most important he says well, the most important thing about the gods is to is to have correct beliefs about them. Beliefs, right. but there is no prayer in Epictetus, and even divination. You got to you know he's like, hey, don't use divination except in the very last resort. And he's kind of un, unlike the other Stoics in that respect, right? Who um, at least going by Cicero were were into divination. He's like you know anything that you can figure out yourself handle that yourself and then go to the gods with that but do it kind of kind of carefully right but there's no like you know when we talk about somebody having like a a prayer life or something like that there's nothing like that in in epictetus whereas you know in in later once later platonism starts getting really interested in uh the daimones and and the gods we have some room for that right um but i didn't talk about that in this I wanted to keep it simpler. Did you have your hand up, Owen? I do now. Uh, can you say a little bit more about the, uh, the useful, the, uh, oh. the crazy? Because um, there seems to be three different, uh, trying to understand your point, which is well yeah. taken, that it is a good for our style. Yeah, it's just a lesser good, right? Uh, I'm, wonder, I'm wondering if some distinctions uh, might be made here. Um, okay. I mean, yeah, my, yeah, my, my father basically... Uh, uh, had uh, I, the tools I inherited from my father um, mm. you know, cleaned out his place with a, a screwdriver and a hammer. That's it. That's it? <laughs> that was the kind of guy he had. But my, my wife's father yeah. had all these woodworking tools, which I'm sure are very useful if I did that stuff. Yeah. But, the, but you know, off the goodwill or whatever, because I'm not, I'm not, they're not going to be useful to me. Yeah, yeah. They're only potentially useful. And then you have something like... Um, uh, a skill like being able to read French, which is useful to me because I'm I'm, I'm a scholar, yeah. <laughs> and there's a lot of this good stuff written in French. 
but might not be useful to other people. And then you've got things like physical strength, which presumably is useful to everybody yeah. as a virtue of the body, albeit not. And the lack of which is harmful, right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so presumably that's because by nature, all of us are teleologically organized. Yeah, yeah. And we need to deal with the world in certain ways. And sometimes we need to lift up heavy stuff. And, uh, yeah. And, and, and so um, clearly physical strength would be useful in that way. But the other kinds of utility would seem to be contextual. Yeah. I'm not sure that, you know, being able to do calculations very, very quickly or, 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 or virtues like that or abilities like that would be unqualified goods for ours. Well, they're not unqualified, right? Well, um, I mean, most of, yeah, I think you're right that most of the things... They are useful at a lower level. I think you're doing more than simply saying useful for you not useful for me. That's right, yeah. Say, no, these are good things to have. Uh, yeah, I mean... However, um, and don't mistake it for the real, for the, for the, uh, uh, the focal instance of... Uh, uh, I think that's right, yeah. And, and you know, it, it's sort of like if we wanted to screw around with Kant, right, and uh, buy into some of his stuff and then reject the rest. So, you know, he famously distinguishes between these uh, rules of skill and counsels of prudence and then genuine, you know, uh, commands of uh, of morality, and he's he's not all that happy about the um, counsels of prudence because eh, who who knows what we really need and you know it's not it's not enough to to get us where we need to go. And we can say eh, you're well you're wrong about that, Kant. You know we can say that at least for the most part, human beings need this kind of stuff and they need this kind of stuff and this is useful for them. And but then there's all sorts of things that are much more qualified. Um, even physical strength, right? It's kind of funny. There is this uh, endless discussion on Twitter that I that keeps coming po popping up in my stream, and I am sure it's because of who I follow. About um, you know how important it is to be jacked, you know, build yourself up like those special forces guys, you know, or like the Spartans and all that, all this hypermasculine stuff. And then there's always like some military person will point out to them, guys like that don't last a second on the battlefield because they run out of energy real quick. And it, all those muscles take a lot of energy to keep, you know, keep them working. And so, you know, the physical strength. Now you could say, well, so maybe it's a matter of like appropriate for this situation or too much or stuff like that. But there's a lot of people out there who do, do seem to think that the useful for them would be as much of this as possible, you know, or like if I just had a billion dollars, you know, then everything would fall into place. Um, well, no, because you can easily screw your life up. A lot of lottery winners wind up quite unhappy, you know, as it, as it turns out. So, yeah, the realm of the useful has to be kind of, I won't say completely heterogeneous, but we, we would have to make differentiations Within it, and I don't, I don't think Aris. I mean, I haven't like read everything in the Aristotelian corpus, so maybe there's passages somewhere where he is doing something like that. Um, and and I will say too, in the rhetoric, there's a lot of good discussion of the useful and the the harmful in that part about deliberative rhetoric, right? My hesitation is is that the way you are speaking makes it sound as like. Utility is an intrinsic good, albeit a oh. less important one, uh, as opposed to uh, simply a uh, yeah. No, it's, it's that uh, under certain contexts. Uh, I'll, I'll put it to you this way: so it's not an intrinsic anything that is the useful is not an intrinsic good by itself. It's good because it leads to something else. However, it can take on an aura within a culture, within a family, within a person's life. Of, yeah, this this really is something good. Even though you know, if they analyzed it carefully, they would realize, oh, I really just want this for this, right? Does that help? Yeah, the prime example there is money. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Uh, what else? Yeah. Hi. Thank you for the talk. Um, I wanted to give uh, suggest uh, maybe some passages from the history of animals. Oh, good. Uh, so, I mean, Aristotle is very careful uh, about what he says about the intelligence and animals. Yeah. Um, and there's a passage that I have, 
Um, um, I mean, it's not a problem what you're, what you're, what you're, do, what you're doing, but it'd be interesting to see what is the uh, uh, connotations or limitations of hmm. the cries of animals. Yeah, yeah. As signals. So here he's talking about. So the claims seem to display many forms of intelligence upon the monk. They fly far away, uh, high up, get a broader vantage points. But if they see clouds and storms, they fly back down. They have a leader and additional criers. Um, I can't find a lead for that yet. Mm. Uh, amongst them, on the farther edges of the flock, so the leader's voice, so the uh, so that the leader's voice be heard. When they settle down, they go back to sleep with their uh, heads under their wings, standing on one leg. He's very observant. Alternating, <laughs> alternating while the leader stays on the lookout, head uncovered, and signals with a cry when he sees something. And I think that yeah, there's yeah. something here uh, about um, signal signaling. The language is to the same as I think. Uh, um, uh, Reasoning with science. Okay, yeah. Which James Allen has a great book about that. Um, and so I, I, I found the Greek. Uh, the, the cry word is wow, so it's not anywhere close to Nobles, obviously. But the fact that it is being used to communicate and uh, functions as a kind of practical uh, means of um, practical intelligence. Yeah. Uh, 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 yeah. So, I think there's another really interesting passage unrelated to, the, to this discussion where Aristotle talks about um, what the lion takes pleasure in when he hears a stag. Right, yeah. So I think there's, there's more complexity to the pleasure pain issue there mm. because he says he's not taking pleasure in the cry of the animal but the anticipation of it as food. Yeah. If I remember the passage correctly. Yeah. So there's the so there's a anticipatory pleasure which is not tied to just the taste of the animal. Yeah, yeah. That would be food or something like that. So more complex kind of pleasure. Yeah, and you know, and if we want to, I mean, let's say we take off on the lion example. If we were thinking about this when we put Aristotle and other ancient thinkers to the side and we're like, what, what is really going on in, now, admittedly, it's, we're, we have to anthropomorphize to some degree, but we could say, um, what's going on when they're, they're, they're hunting, right? They, you know, they probably do enjoy not just the sinking their teeth into it, tasting the blood, you know, anticipating I'm going to have a full belly, but the, you know, the enjoyment of the, the chase. And they, you know, they, um, I mean, when we watch, I mean, we know, we know so much more about animals nowadays, we ordinary schlubs, because we have, you know, access to YouTube and documentaries and stuff like that. And we can actually see these in, in, in really interesting intraspecies interactions, and then even like uh, interspecies interactions, like, you know, seeing, um, you know, admittedly these are in captivity or, or you know, in domesticated situations, but seeing uh, a panther uh, playing around with a, a dog, you know, a Rottweiler, or, you know, the fact that cheetahs now have emotional support dogs in, in zoos, you know, and there's all this very interesting stuff. I think we have to say that, yeah, their, their psychic life is way more complicated than the ancients thought. Or even, I mentioned Heidegger, you know, Heidegger saying, you know, animals don't have a world. They sure, they sure as hell seem to. I mean, maybe not oysters, right? Uh, maybe not even, I don't know if a spider does or not. Um, what were you going to say? Uh, I'm reminded of Arian Kohat, who argues that even rocks have a world. Oh, interesting. Uh, in, a, in what sense do they have a world? Like, because they have an environment that they engage with? Or? Nothing like that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I mean, Heidegger means it in like the sense of having horizons and all this kind of stuff. But I mean, I think when we when we look at these uh, very interesting animal interactions, um, or we consider social animals like bees and ants and stuff like that, there's a hell of a lot more going on than we gave them credit for. Now, does that mean we should call them rational? I, I don't know. You know, I'm, I'm just making a very minor point. I live on a farm out in Walworth County, 
press the fear. And when the coyotes mm. uh, start, yeah, howling, yeah, improve their communal bonds. It's just amazing. And they, you know, they took down a deer back behind our shed and feasted on it for uh, quite a long time. Yeah. And if it wasn't for my dog barking at them, the, uh, to me, the howling of it also showed the communal nature of it. Right, yeah. Exactly, it's the communal part. Yeah. 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 I mean, it's... A, they would just kind of like save their own food for themselves. Yeah. It's a completely communal experience. I mean, on that note with communication, we, we didn't know until fairly recently that elephants were communicating with each other all the time. They're just vocalizing at ranges that we couldn't hear that happened to transmit over miles and miles and miles, you know. They use their tusks, and they use their trunks too, their motion of their trunks in the kind of cycle. Oh, right, yeah, yeah. Very young. Yeah. It has, it, has, it has syntax, it has a learned syntax. Yeah. Now, I mean, coming back to this, can we say that animals, like, deal with uh, the just and the unjust? Probably not, right? But um, certainly what's good and bad for them you know, they communicate about it. They sometimes um, help each other out with it. You know, they're they're elephants mourn their dead. That's true. When they, across, when they come across an elephant carcass, they'll stop and sway over it. Yeah. Even that of a even that of a stranger. Yeah. What's that? Oh, interesting. I didn't know that. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Oh. Oh. Hello. Hey. Thank you. Thank you very much for your talk. <clears throat> I have some remarks and uh, comments. Uh, all are uh, associated, uh, related to, uh, to, to the first part of your paper about uh, uh, Asperger. Why? Why I have such kind of impression that you're uh, in, uh, in interpreting Aristotle, actually you follow Heidegger at some point. For example, uh, in Heidegger's complete, uh, complete works, volume 33, uh, Heidegger comments on um, uh, Aristotle's Metaphysica uh, Tita, uh, uh, and uh, Heidegger says, okay, the human, human beings uh, is a rational animal uh, having logos in the sense that the yeah. human beings, only, only human beings, can touch the opposites. That is the good, bad, um, just and just, okay. etc. Yeah, yeah. Uh, on the, other, on, the other, on the other hand, however, animals cannot touch the opposite. For example, a dog cannot distinguish between uh, poison and medicine. Uh, no, poison and food sometimes, or the bad food and uh, 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 good food. Uh, so sometimes a dog uh, will be killed yeah, yeah. by eating something bad. Okay, this is Heidegger's interpretation. At some point, I, I, I have such, such a kind of impression that you follow Heidegger. This first uh, remark, second, uh, you say that the you deal with is this uh, opposite virtues uh, in the context of Heide, uh, Aristotle. You say that okay, the, this opposite virtues is a basis for communication, human communication. Uh, I understand, as I understand, your fo your focus is actually on practical philosophy, practical activity. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, but I I would like to say this is not only. Uh, uh, such kind of opposite work uh, uh, not only the basis for for our activity communication, but also for doing philosophy. For mm -hmm. example, Axel says, okay, in the yeah, theory, yeah. in the theoretical activity, we human beings strive for something, uh, strive for the truth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We can we can get the truth if and only if we can first of all distinguish between something good and uh, the truth and falsehood. In the practical activity, we aim at something good. If uh, we can, we can get something. Uh, we can get good, good thing uh, only if we we, we uh, distinguish between the good and bad. Yeah, yeah. So I think I would like to say the uh, uh, the, the opposite of virtues are not only the basis for practical uh, communication, but also for uh, activities of human beings. Whether it's theoretical or uh, practical. Well, I am saying that it is. We, we use this all the time with the activities to judge them, to you know decide what we're going to do, yeah. to to prioritize. And but I think yeah, you know, one of the things with Aristotle 
that I've always found um, problematic is in the you know, in the practical, let's call them the practical treatises or ethical political treatises, right? He'll sometimes say things like, ah, you know, this isn't about like, you know, knowing a lot of things. This is ultimately, this is about action and that's what we're interested in. And then you're like, well, why the hell did you write a whole book about it, you know? Um, you know, why, why, in, so take the politics, for example, you know, I mean, there's not, he doesn't address every single possible issue or problem. Um, and he is clearly concerned with, you know, what's going on in the, uh, the polis in his society. Um, but you can say, you know, this is also a theoretical work. It's not just a merely practical work. They, they kind of overlap with each other. And, and we were talking about this earlier. Uh, I don't remember if it was at this lunch or a previous one. Uh, you know, theoretical activities are also practically oriented all the time, right? I mean, it, sometimes in ways that are extrinsic, like, oh, I need to write a grant so I got some money so I, I, I can actually afford to work on this, right? So I better convince... This is exactly Heidegger. Yeah. This is exactly Heidegger. Theoria is a, is, a, is a special case of practice. Yeah, I mean, Heidegger is saying that, I think there's others who are saying that as well, you know, yeah. American pragmatism is uh, notorious for making claims like that too. But yeah, I think, I think you're right, yeah. Um, now, if, if, if what I've done is essentially just, you know, um, retrace Heidegger, uh, that, that, that's a mistake on my part, but that's okay, I guess, you know. Better than retracing Descartes, maybe. Any other questions, or we might wrap up a little earlier? Did you have one? Yeah. I just very quickly have follow up on one of the previous questions. I just have a, like a very broad comment. So maybe we can say that anything that has a relation to the world has logos. Oh, ah. Uh, reaching out to the world beyond yourself. I mean, it would be broad. No, because, I mean, an oyster does interact with the world, right? And even like register presumably something analogous to pain and how it creates the pearl, you know, tries to secrete the things. But words, we don't want to say it's got logos, do we? No, I mean, not, I, I, I mentioned specifically, it's a very broad sense, but okay. the idea would be could you have awareness without having some degree of logos? Yes. Animals. Yeah. Yeah, by stasis. Yeah, yeah. 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 No, but they say, <laughs> but, but wait, but because of course we are, we are thinking about logos in a very broad sense. Because the use of imagination is a sort of thing. That's in Aristotle. So anything that has fantasia yeah. has some initial degree of logos. Of course, we are not talking about no, logos. No, he denies that. <laughs> we are not talking about logos in the, as a specific difference of the human being. I'm trying to, huh. to understand because if you go to the, the, the anima, Aristotle uses the word legging and ate in the oris for the common sense. Yeah. And animals have common sense. No, and of course, they don't have cogitative. That's the distinction the cogitative and um, what's the other one, the estimative in the medieval times. So, I, I, of course, I'm, I'm broadening, but it, it was like a big point, I think, was suggested by some of the comments here that it looks like, uh, in a way, relation is, is two ways. No, you yeah. don't have simply say, oh, I have awareness, but I don't have any sort of saying, any sort of logos. That's my point. I mean, I know it's very broad, and I don't. Know. I mean, we could also, if we want to like shift into like a theistic framework, we could say, well, everything has logos in the sense that like whatever it is, God made it and implanted it with, again, whatever it is, it's some, you know, uh, it's, it's pattern, it's blueprint, it's, it's stuff. And then we can discover that in it. But I think then we're in such a different... No, I don't uh, want to go so far as yeah. to say awareness cannot be simply by like being hit by something external. Not just stimulus response. It's yeah. implicitly propositional. Something. Okay. I mean, I know it's, ah. maybe it's going to be young Aristotle, but... Um. Yeah, I, I think it is. So that's a, that's a great place maybe to end. Um, oh. You know, I, I, I think that's something to that. Like, circling back to your politics passage, um, you began with the idea of the did you bring this or is this new thinking? <laughs> we should have talked about this. I don't know. Man is more a political animal than bees and, yeah. and so on. This is very mentions one of those. Like, whereas mere voice is for identification, I'm using the translation yeah. uh, from the uh, revised Oxford. 
um, mere voices but an indication of pleasure or pain is therefore found in other animals. Power of speech is intended to be set forth by expedient and inexpedient. Right. And therefore, likewise, the just and the unjust. And here, I imagine it's slow. Yeah. Right? Um, my TLG is super slow, I'm sorry. <laughs> kind of I get my politics uh, passage up. But it, it's interesting that it says expedient and inexpedient, right? That the animals do. And that's kind of what he's that's, doing yeah. over and over in the history of animals. He's showing how they're able to show uh, a kind of practical intelligence. So uh. um, I only have these passages because I give this to my students as an exercise to figure out in how do we make sense of animal intelligence. So he talks about the intelligence of hedgehogs, talks about weasels. Um, yeah. <coughs> they can distinguish and they can do things that are useful to them. And avoid the harmful, too. And avoid the harmful. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And there are many instances that he observes of this kind of behavior. I mean, we yeah, yeah. the good and the just yet, but we have definitely have behavior which he observes as indicating uh, awareness of the expedient. Or the good yeah, and, and, we, and we also see animals... Um, in the realm of the useful and the harmful, learning from watching each other, like, um, well, a great example of this is uh, cats. There are certain things that they need to, like, learn from other cats how to do well. They can sometimes discover them on their own, but, like, how to kill a mouse, right? Uh, the kittens need to observe another cat doing that, or else they'll just mess around with it, and it, it's very gruesome for the mouse because they don't break its neck right away. Um, the, the verb crinomine to discern. Oh, okay. So yeah. even plants have creases. They don't have people like but crinomine. they have crinomine. Hmm. So I, Where does Aristotle say that? The, the anima, I think he said the anima. Where does Aristotle apply creases to? I mean, in the Timaeus, Plato, Plato gives isthesis to plants. Plants don't. Have any well, anyway, my, my, point, my point is that that would be an example of what I was trying hmm. to say that it's not simply perception or just, I mean, there is a sort of discerning or whatever we want to say. No, that's, that's a sort of relation to the world that is not, it's not simply being hit or receiving things. It's responding to the yeah, world. Yeah. And if that responding to the world implies <clears throat> an initial degree of loss. Plotinus puts all of these things on the continuum of animal intelligence. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Rather than a, a, a simple, you know, like, Man's gate, you know, obviously yeah. we don't. Uh, all the way down from intellect itself down to the earth. And it says every life is a thought. One is a sense thought, another is a, the life of a plant is a growth thought, the life of an animal is yeah, a sense yeah. thought, yeah, and so on. And I really don't think he's being un Aristotelian in, in doing that. If, do you find that? Does Aristotle say that as Plotinus does? No. Yeah, but yeah. I think it's a legitimate and. Extension of. Yeah. development of Aristotle rather than a going against Aristotle. There's a passage of uh, the history of animals which uh, uses theory of continuum, but uh, mm. like not, uh, uh, not for the object, for instance. No, no, it's like, uh, it's like the law of Leibniz, but uh, the law of continuity, but uh, said by Aristotle, right? Uh, so huh. like, uh, in, uh, some, I go by memory. Uh, in the nature, uh, like everything, uh, uh, changes continuously, very slowly from one species to another, uh, so that there is no like real jump uh, whatsoever. I think this is uh, oh, yeah. the first book of the history of animals. Yeah, hmm. And uh, uh, what Ignacio is saying, a lot of these passages in the history of animals, you can't explain them with mere perception. You have to have recourse to some level of memory and try to see it yeah. to explain these behaviors, patterns of behaviors. Um, it's, they, it's not mere response. It's right. Response. And it's not just all driven by, you know, programmed instincts, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. All right, well, we are significantly <laughs> a little over. Uh, so, um, well, thanks very much.